Philippians chapter 4. We'll probably just have one more message in Philippians. And uh, I don't know where Brother Matt went, but he's been helping me preach through Philippians, so he'll be up next Sunday night. And it's on giving. I've never heard Matt preach on giving, have you? He always preaches those light, fluffy sermons that makes everybody happy. You ever notice that? Well, we're going to make him preach one of these controversial sermons next Sunday. So you don't want to miss that. Tell everybody else. You don't need to be here to hear Matt's first negative sermon that he's ever preached. Although to some of us, that's not negative. Giving's not negative, is it? Giving ought to be a joy. Give cheerfully, the Bible says. And you all do. I saw you when I was taking up the offering. Some of y'all were just giggling as you gave. Philippians chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 10 through 13. In 1923, a group of America's most successful financiers met at the Edgewater Beach Hotel in Chicago. Probably nobody here remembers that, 1923. But I was reading, he said among them were Charles Schwab, president of the largest steel company in America, Samuel Insel, president of the greatest utility company in America, Howard Hobson, president of the largest gas company, Richard Whitney, president of the New York Stock Exchange, Albert Fall, member of the President's Cabinet, Jesse Livermore, a Wall Street financier, Ivan Kruger, head of the world's largest monopoly, and Leon Frazier, president of the Bank of International Settlements. They met in 1923. 25 years later, 1948, Billy Rose wrote a syndicated column about the men who met in that meeting. And he called a, a roll call of these men and whatever became of these guys. He said Charles Schwab died bankrupt. Insul died penniless, a fugitive from justice. Whitney had just been released from prison. Fall, Albert Fall had just been pardoned from prison and sent home to die. Livermore and Frazier both committed suicide. Now here was a group of men considered the most successful men in America. And they all ended tragically. Instead of learning how to handle the ups and downs of life, it seems the ups and downs of life manhandled them. The Apostle Paul, in his own testimony, in our text tonight, tells us how to handle life's ups and downs. He experienced both the highs and lows of life. He knew what it was to be up. He knew what it was like to be down. And yet, regardless of the state in which he found himself, he learned a great secret. He learned how to be content, no matter what happened. Now, I want to ask you, how do you handle the ups and downs of life? Are you like a thermometer or a thermostat? A thermostat doesn't change anything. It just registers the temperature, or excuse me, a thermometer. It doesn't change anything. It registers the temperature. It's always going up and down. A thermostat regulates the surroundings and changes them when they need to be changed. All right? Are you like a thermometer, lacking the power to change anything and things around you affect you? Are you like Paul? Paul is like a thermostat. Instead of having things change him, he was able to control 
what was going on around him and control how he reacted to these things. And he shares with us tonight the secret. The secret of contentment. Showing us that we can be victors in life, not victims. Why don't you stand with me if you're physically able. Let's read our text tonight from Philippians chapter 4, beginning with verse number 10. Paul says, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. There's the secret. How to be content, no matter what comes your way. Amen. You may be seated. You want to tell you, notice first of all, we must learn to live a detached life. Learn to live a detached life. Heard about a guy who was uh, walking along in a certain city, and he saw some poor children in the slums, playing and they're having a great time playing make-believe riding an old log there's an old log across the field and they were straddled that log and pretending like they were on horseback and they were having a grand old time was you like that the only thing you had to play with was a log when you grew up some of you didn't have a log did you they're hard to find in oklahoma he saw them and and he said uh wouldn't you wouldn't you like to have a, a horse, a real horse to ride? He said, yes, sir, but we don't have a horse. And we're just getting the most fun we can out of what we've got. That's a good way to live. Just make the most out of what you've got. Paul tells us that he was perfectly content whether he was abounding or whether he was being abased. Whether he had plenty or whether he had nothing, it didn't matter. He learned a great lesson. Learned to live a detached life. He speaks, first of all, of the circumstances of his life. Verse 11, he speaks of his state or the circumstances of his life. He said, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. First, he speaks of these circumstances that were abasing, that would humble somebody or make them low, he knew what it was like to be humbled. He knew what it was like to live on the meager or live in the miserable or live by the modest. He, uh, by the way, remember when he wrote this, where was he? He was up in a penthouse, was he? Being waited on hand and foot while he wrote the epistle to Philippians. Is that right? Be like, yes. He was in prison. He wasn't being waited on by a servant. He was being watched by a guard. And yet even in that circumstance, he could be content. He could still have joy in his heart for the Lord. He knew how to abound. That was when the river was overflowing, when his cup runneth over. Before he was saved, it's believed that he grew up in a wealthy family. Probably had everything he could want back then. He was educated under Gamaliel, which was a very expensive education. It would take some substantial means to attain that kind of education. So that tells us his family was probably wealthy. As an adult, before he got saved, he was a Pharisee. He belonged to that upper class with all the pomp and prestige that they had. Oh, he'd been on top. He knew what it was like to abound when it comes to the things of the world. And he's also been on the bottom. He's known prosperity. He's known poverty. He's had it all. He's had nothing. 
He had experienced the ups and downs of life. By the way, many folks seem to do better with little than they do with a lot. You know, prosperity has ruined a lot of people. Prosperity has done more damage to believers than has adversity. It tends to draw some people away from God and from the church. Somebody said it's harder to handle a lot than it is to handle just a little. That's true, isn't it? You got a lot, that's a lot of work to take care of everything. It's a lot easier if you got just a little. So thank God if you only have a little. Doesn't take a lot of work to handle that, does it? Note also the contentment of his life in verse 11. And whatsoever state or circumstance I've ever been in, I have learned to be content. Have you learned that? Are you content? You don't ever gripe and complain, do you? You ever feel sorry for yourself and host a pity party and nobody comes? I saw a cartoon showing two fields with lush green grass and a fence divided these fields and on each side of the fence was a mule and each mule had his head stuck through the fence grazing on the other field. What do they say? Grass is always greener on the other side. That's why a lot of of people are never content. They always think it's greener on the other side. Many church members seem to be that way. They're always looking for greener pastures. They're never content. They're never satisfied. They're never happy. I like what Ben Franklin once said. He said contentment will make a poor man rich and discontentment will make a rich man poor. A Quaker once promised a choice piece of land to the most contented person in the village. He advertised, if you can prove you're the most contented person in this village, I'll give you this very choice piece of property. And Many people applied And he said to each one, he said the same thing to each one, if thou be content, why do you want my land? So by wanting the land, they were proving they were not content. Unless you could say, well, I wanted to build a church house on. I don't know what he would have done then. Are you content? In a cemetery in Mary Old England, there's a grave marker that's inscribed, She died from want of things. She died from want of things. Next to her was her husband, and on his marker it said he died trying to give it to her. Is that how you're going to die? What's the lesson here? You know, a hundred years ago, it was estimated that The average American had 70 wants, 70 things that he felt like he needed. That was 100 years ago. Today, it's determined that people have nearly 500 wants. It's gone from 70 to 500. Now, that's wants, not needs. Some things you need, some things you want. What you want is not always what you need. A lot of times what you want is probably the last thing you need. That's the the generation in which we live. People want and they want more and more and more. Never content. Never satisfied. We are in a generation that wants more to be satisfied is probably the least content generation ever. With all the things we've got, with all the gadgets we have today, all the time-consuming appliances and these things, 
and probably the least content generations ever lived. You don't have to say amen if you don't want to. Just, just listen. Paul said, and go, to, go to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. 1 Timothy 6 and 6. Still on this same subject. He says, but godliness with contentment. Now look at this. Godliness plus contentment equals great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, food and clothes, let us therewith be content. A person, listen, a person is indeed wealthy if he has learned to be content with what he has. That's great gain, spiritually. Paul was a wealthy man at one time. He lost all of his wealth when he followed Christ, but he's still content. It describes the being independent of external circumstances. When Paul declared that he was content, he was just saying he has learned to live in complete detachment from the circumstances of this life. Folks, his, his happiness, his joy, his contentment, it did not depend on what he had, physically speaking, materially speaking. It did not matter what was going on around him. All that mattered was who was living in him. But don't you have the same person living in you? H.A. Ironside, famous preacher years gone by, he once asked a fellow Christian how he's getting along, and the other fellow said, well, fairly well under the circumstances. Ironside said, you know, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to hear that you're living under the circumstances. That's not God's will. It's not God's will for any of us to live under the circumstances He's taught us how to live above the circumstances. Have we learned this? Folks, listen, no matter what, no matter where, no matter why, we can be content with what we have. Live a detached life from the things of this world. That's not what's really important. That's not what we're here for. We're here to serve the Lord. We've got a short time we talked about this morning. Life is brief. and We need to make it count. Do the most we can with it. Secondly, we must learn to live a dependent life. Look at verse 12. He describes the secret of being content, being dependent on the Lord. I know both how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I am taught, I am instructed to be full, to be hungry, to abound, to suffer need. What he's saying is God taught him that there were times when it was God's will for Paul to do without. It was, there were times when God needed Paul to abound. There were times when God needed Paul to be abased. Because God had a plan for his life. He was working things out, and it called for Paul to endure different things at different times. Notice the allowance of certain circumstances by God. Now, if you're a prosperity gospel disciple, you're not going to like what I'm about to say. Prosperity gospel says God never wants you to suffer anything. God never wants you to be without anything. God never wants you to be sick. God always wants you to abound and be healthy and wealthy. And that's a bunch of baloney. That's not what the Bible says by any stretch. Look at Paul. Look at these characters in the Bible. It's obvious that there were times when God called upon them to suffer greatly for his name. Are we any different today? 
He said he had been instructed. Kind of a technical expression in the Greek language. Kind of talks about the initiation that certain uh, religious sects would go through. They would have to be initiated and given secret wisdom that was not given to everybody. And he seems to be using it here the idea that God had initiated certain circumstances. He had appointed them. He had arranged them whereby at times Paul could be full. At times he would be hungry. At times he would abound. At times he would suffer need. Whatever God had ordained was for a purpose. And Paul was aware of this. That all that happened in his life was directed by God. These were not accidents that happened to Paul. These were divine appointments that happened to Paul. He was in prison. God arranged for him to be in prison. God had a purpose for him. He wrote the prison epistles. He had a lot of time to write in prison. God needed to put him in a study somewhere where he wouldn't be distracted so he could write several of these epistles that we are studying today. And Paul understood this, that these things were meant to be a blessing and a ministry to others. That's why James 1, 2 says, My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations. That looks strange if you just look at that. How can I be joyful if I'm going through different temptations? Because God's working. That divers means many colored. It was used of a garment that was made up of a wide variety of colors. Uh, maybe like a Joseph's coat of many colors. What he's saying is your life, my life, is like a garment that is being woven by God. And he uses various colors of circumstances to make that garment according to his plan. I'm going to wax poetical tonight. I've got several poems I want to share with you. Many of you probably have heard the Divine Weaver by William Sutcliffe. I don't know if you can read that or not. We punish you for sitting in the back. Jonathan, you can read it, can't you? Okay. God bless you. Kendra. Myself. Y'all read it pretty good, can't you? Let me read it to those folks in the back. My life is but a weaving between my Lord and me. I cannot choose the colors. He weaveth steadily. Oftentimes he weaveth sorrow. And I, in foolish pride, forgetteth he seeth the upper, and I the underside. Not till the loom is silent and the shuttles cease to fly, shall God unroll the canvas and explain the reason why. The dark threads are as needful in the weaver's skillful hand as the threads of gold and silver in the pattern he has planned. That's pretty good. And that's exactly what Paul's talking about here. God is weaving your life. Let God do his work. And don't resist it. Don't fight against him. Let him use you to his honor and glory. The allowance of certain circumstances by God. Secondly, the acceptance of certain circumstances from God. Paul is saying that he did not wrestle with these things. He didn't struggle with the why or the what of each circumstance. He accepted this as part of God's plan, part of God's will for Paul's life. The Bible clearly teaches that God providentially works in our lives. That word provident is from two Latin words. Providence, pro is before. And video is to see. Providence is God sees beforehand. God knows what's coming. God sees what's going to happen beforehand. But not only that, God gets involved 
in what's going to happen. He works things out in advance. He arranges the circumstances and the situations for the purpose of fulfilling his will in your life. Now, you can go along with God as he works, or you can try to work against him. You can resist God's will for your life. Here's where Romans 8.28 comes in. Romans 8.28. For we know, what do we know? We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. You believe that? You need to believe that. It, it'll make your life go a lot sweeter, a lot smoother, if you'll believe that verse. Just believe God, is He's working everything out. And there's times He requires me to go through some hardship. There's times I, I need to go through some sorrow and some affliction. But it's all going to work out because God is doing the work. It's all going to end right amen believe that and it'll help you to endure much of what we have to endure in this life there's a secret there realizing we are where God has placed us and to accept that and be content with God's arrangement then finally we must learn to live a dynamic life you might be sitting there saying, Preacher, I, I just don't know if I can do, I don't know if I can face the ups and downs of life with contentment. I, I'm not sure that I'm able to accept the bad things that happen in my life. Look what he says in verse 13. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. I can endure the bad times. I can... I can experience the afflictions and the trials and tribulations because Christ will strengthen me. God will give me the grace I need. Is that what it says in 2 Corinthians 9, 8? God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. That's a heavenly dynamic, folks, that's available to us today. Paul, Paul does not say, I cannot. That's the that's language of pessimism. He does not say, I can in my own strength. That's the language of presumption. He says, I can through Christ. That's the language of power. Dynamic power from heaven. Somebody said, Christian, you take Christ out of Christian, what's left? Iron. Take Christ out of Christian and iron is left. A lot of people say, I, I can do whatever I put my heart and mind to. I can do all things if, if I just believe hard enough. I know that's what Joel Osteen and Norman Vincent Peale teach. But it's bad theology. It's not what I can do. It's not what you can do. It's what Christ can do through us. We must depend on Christ. It reminds me of the poor farmer who worked hard his entire life and worked and worked and worked and sweated and toiled and Never really had much of anything, just could barely eke out a living. When he died, his property was found to be sitting on a lake of oil. Underneath him, all those years he was toiling in his fields, underneath him was a vast treasure. And all he had to do was tap into it. He didn't know it was there. And folks, I contend that there are many church members. They never tap into the great power of God because they don't know about it. They don't come to church and sit under the teaching of God's word whereby they can learn these things. 
whereby they can apply it to their lives and live the abundant life. Hey, are you tapping into that well of power that's available? Through Christ, I can do all things. So the heavenly strength is available and the human sufficiency that is accomplished. We can face all things. We can accept all things. We can be content in all things. Paul's saying, I'm ready for anything. I'm ready for anything because I've got the strength of Christ within me. That's a good way to live, folks. I'm ready for anything. Are you ready for anything that may come? You don't know what's coming, do you? In closing, William Henley was born in 19 or excuse me, 1849. Early in life, in his teenage years, he was crippled. I think it was by polio. He was one of the early humanists. He wrote a poem that's famous. It's called Invictus. Have you ever heard of the poem Invictus? It's a Latin word for unconquered. It's often quoted or read in high school, college graduations. And, uh, oh my goodness, I can't even read that. Everybody come up on stage and we'll read it. I asked her to put them side by side. But on one side is Invictus by William Ernest Henley. On the other side is a poem called My Captain by Dorothea Day, a Christian. She took his humanistic poem and gave it a Christian bent. Now here's Invictus. You've heard this. There's a movie out, Invictus, about the... Mandel, what was this guy down in South Africa? Nelson Mandela, that's what it was. And uh, he quoted Invictus, and it was in the movie, and they named the movie after this. But here, listen, you've heard this before. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. Whatever gods may be, that's, that's good Christian theology. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade. And yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. That's humanism. Self-sufficiency is what we can do. Dorothea Day, is this any kin to you, Brother Gordon? This is Gordon's grandma. She wrote this. She rejected Invictus. Said, now here's the way it is. Out of the night that dazzles me, bright as the sun from pole to pole, I thank the God I know to be for Christ, the conqueror of my soul. Since his the sway of circumstance, I would not wince nor cry aloud. Under that rule which men call chance, my head with joy is humbly bowed. Beyond this place of sin and tears, that life with him and his the aid, despite the menace of the years, keeps and shall keep me unafraid. I have no fear, though straight the gate. He cleared from punishment the scroll. Christ is the master of my fate. Christ is the captain of my soul. That's biblical. The preacher I've always liked Invictus. Now you've ruined it for me. Hang around. I'll probably ruin some more things before it's over. But you're not the master of your fate, folks. You're not the captain of your soul. That is humanistic advice for failure. If one is the captain of his soul, he's going to be shipwrecked. You better make sure Christ 
is the captain of your soul. Is he? Is the Lord Jesus tonight the captain of your soul? You know he wants to be. And if you'll let him, he'll infuse his strength and power into your life. And he'll enable you to live a life of contentment and joy, awaiting that greater life to come we talked about this morning.